episode of Cage Side. I got my man Joe Selecki on the show today. Um, for those of you who don't know Joe, he just recently defeated, and I, and I don't like you for this, but you recently defeated one of my all-time favorites, Cowboy, in a grappling tournament. <laughs> but kudos to you. You look great. Uh, brother, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's these these matches and fights with like people I grew up watching. People are like, are you so excited? I'm like, not really. I don't want to beat the people I like. <laughs> so that that was one of them for sure. Were you so you were a cowboy fan as well? Uh, yeah. I mean, I I came up watching him. He was always the striker, so I grew up a grappler. So he wasn't one of my favorites, but I obviously respect him a ton. But uh, I fought Jim Miller earlier this year, and that was one that like I grew up like loving the Miller brothers. So that was like, that was a weird one. That was a fun one, but real interesting. So, so now that you say that, so both of those scenarios, how does that feel? I've always wondered how that feels. Cause it's like in our case, like when you, when you talked, when we interview somebody or whatever, who, you know, who we know it, um, it's a little bit surreal, but because it's, it's a different environment, it feels kind of, it makes sense. But in your case where you're about to compete against them and, 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 push yourself as an athlete against them. How does, is that a little weird to digest? I think the camp is weird because you don't know what it's going to be like until you get there, you know? And it's like eight or 10 weeks of just like, uh, how's this guy? And then when you actually, you realize they're human, you know, like you see them and they're, they're your height, they're your size. They're sweating and cutting weight just like you are. And it's all the same, you know? But uh, yeah, until you get in there, it's, you kind of put on this big pedestal, I feel like. So when you're punching them in the face, you're not thinking like, oh, this is just weird. Uh, not not once I'm in there. For, for me personally, I know people that do still have like stage fright during the fight, you know, and I've never been like that, which I'm very thankful about. So we were just talking before before we, we got started. Uh, so you're currently in North Carolina, right? And But you grew up in South Jersey. Yeah. Uh, so it's been a couple of years, but how has that transition been? Yeah, it was culture shock at first. So I, I went from South Jersey, right outside Philly, uh, Glassboro area, down to Myrtle Beach to start to go to college. And that was in 2012. And then spent a lot of time down there. I met my wife there. I trained there. I started fighting MMA out of there. And then uh, discovered a school here in Wilmington, North Carolina. It was an hour and a half away, which is uh, John Salter, who's like a world-class fighter, both for the Bellator middleweight title uh abu dhabi uh qualifier so just super highly ranked jiu-jitsu mma everything right down the road so i started going to train there every single week and uh eventually we just decided about four years ago to move here um how was going to how was going to college in Myrtle beach was that like uh, an insane party town or or no uh it's supposed to be so it's coastal carolina university but for me i, I was never really into any of that so uh, you know, when I was in the school, I was really into jujitsu and training and all that. So I never really got into like even a ton of extracurriculars or anything in school. I had friends and stuff, but I wasn't like Mr. Popularity. So same thing going to college. It was like, I kind of just went to class, went and trained, went to class, went and trained again or lifted or whatever I did. And, uh, but there was a lot of parties going on. I don't, I wasn't invited to them, but, uh, yeah, there, it definitely, uh, you know, kids like to hang out by the beach and, I only ask, like, I haven't been in forever, but when I was, like, when I was growing up, uh, my parents, I, I don't know how they discovered Myrtle Beach, but, like, that that was their idea of, like, let's go, you know, let's drive down south and go to this great, you know, we knew nothing about it. And we went, like, maybe twice, or and I was, like, very early teens, so, I, like, it's the last thing you want to do, you know, is be with your parents hanging out and you're seeing, like, the, all this partying happening. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so that was my very limited experience so long ago that uh, I was just curious how it was for you. Um, tell me about growing up in Jersey and your, like, how was your family? When did you get interested in, in the sport? How did that all come about? Yeah, so for me, it was, uh, it was, I was a little, little kid. And I was just interested in martial arts. Uh, it was the Power Rangers. You know, I was four and five wanting to be like them. I didn't really know jujitsu was a thing or the UFC even at that point. And uh, my brother was playing baseball. He was, he's a little older than me. He's about six years older than me. So we moved towns. We moved from uh, like Washington Township over to Winona. And he wasn't playing as much. So I always tease him and say, like, my mom says it's town politics. He just probably wasn't a good athlete. 
But uh, so they're like, yo, you want to do karate? So we're going to put him in karate. And, you know, if he likes it, we'll send you next year or, or whenever you start kindergarten. So, okay, cool. So he went, he'd start a karate and he, he took to it. He liked it. But that was 1997 or eight when he started. And it's right when jiu-jitsu is starting to get hot a little bit, you know, not mainstream by any means, but it's starting to take off a little bit. Uh, you know, Max Size was in Philadelphia, the first jiu-jitsu school there. And then uh, a couple of their guys had branched out in New Jersey. And we had met, uh, you know, John Hassett and through him or through our original instructor, Jim Fortunato. So uh, he had actually seen the effectiveness of grappling and jiu-jitsu and switched the whole school over by the time he got his blue belt. Because, you know, back then a blue belt is like you can teach. A purple belt was like super high level. So... By the time I started, he had kind of really taken the emphasis away from karate and put it all on jiu-jitsu. So really through accident, we got into, you know, grappling and competing and, and all that stuff. My parents wanted the discipline aspect, the martial arts, the uniform, the lining up. And uh, we kind of cross-trained in that too. I ended up getting a black belt in karate and all that. But uh, that, it was a very heavy emphasis on jiu-jitsu. So we trained there for about two years. And then we ended up with his instructor, John Hassett, uh, in Washington Township. And, I was there until I left New Jersey, and even now, like that's my lifelong instructor. That's who was in my uh, corner when I grabbed a cowboy the other night. When I go back home, you know, I always see him. So, at what? So, what do your parents do for a living? Uh, so, my dad works for a company which you probably heard of up there, Produce Junction. Um, and then uh, my mom stayed home with us. She worked at our school a little bit in the lunchroom and stuff, but uh, she probably had the craziest job. I was raising three maniacs. So, so tell me about, so you have what, two brothers? I got a, uh, an older brother and an older sister. She's, she's the, you know, she was the one that had to deal with us being crazy all the time. Cause you know, my brother tried to beat me up and stuff and, you know, doing brother stuff and she had to hang, you know, she's playing basketball and all the stuff that we were doing growing up and just like, uh, she's hanging in the backyard, you know, taking us to school sometimes. So, uh, older sister, older brother, and I'm the youngest by a lot. So, uh, yeah, I, I got to learn all the hard lessons through them and then not make too many mistakes and focus on training my whole life. Um, at what point, um, so you're doing jujitsu and you're doing karate and all that stuff. At what kind of age or what point do you become familiar with the sport of MMA? Uh, probably around 10 to 12, you know, from what I remember. I remember, it's funny, I was watching some old UFCs the other day with my wife uh, on Fight Pass and we were watching like, I think it was UFC 46 or 52 was a real early one. And she's like, Oh, this is crazy. Like, this is not like it is now. And I was like, Oh, this is what I wanted to do. There was no fight kits and ESPN and press conference. And uh, so the first one we rented from Blockbuster was I rented, uh, I think it was UFC 18 and 19 young guns with Tito Ortiz and Guy Mezger. And uh, I remember popping it in the VCR and being like, He's like giving them middle fingers and stuff at the end. And I was like, oh man, I'm not supposed to be watching this. Like we grabbed the wrong thing from Blockbuster. And then we grabbed the most recent one after that because we were hooked. And it was uh, UFC 46, Supernatural. So it had to be, you know, what's that, 2003 or four when uh, we started watching like that. And uh, when I saw that, which is crazy because I was terrible at jujitsu and in competition, I had awful results. I was just like the most nervous wreck. I could never get – like I, I knew a lot of the techniques, but I could never get – I didn't have the athleticism. I couldn't put it with my brain. So uh, the fact that I saw that, I was like, I want to do that when I grow up. Like uh, somebody should have grabbed me and shook me and been like, you cannot do that. You need to do something else. That's hilarious. So you so you were vocal about it? You told your family that I want to do that? Or you kind of kept it inside? Um. So – I kind of channeled it. They didn't really want me to fight, rightfully. So I channeled it a lot towards like wanting to compete in jiu-jitsu and tried to pursue that. Uh, and, and like a big goal of mine, you know, growing up was go to go to ADCC and compete there. Um, you know, the super fights, like what we had at Fury Grappling that night in Philly weren't really a thing. Um, so it was just, I wanted to be a martial artist. You know, I wanted to compete in any sense of the word, which was, uh, you know, professional competitor, professional fighter, anything like that was, uh, yeah. So I would talk about it. I talked about it to a lot of the guys at the gym too. One of the guys was telling a story after I got signed on the contender series. Um, our buddy Emery, who's a, a first or second degree black belt now, he still trains, he's been training forever. And, uh, you know, he had successful businesses and stuff. And he remembers me grabbing him and being like, hey, Emery, like, you're good with money, you're good with business. Uh, can you make a living, like, competing, teaching, fighting? Like, can I make a living doing that? Can I be like, and he's like, he's like, I knew something was off with you when you asked me that <laughs> at like 10. Well, you know, by the way, that was good kind of, that was mature foresight on your part. I want to make this my living for the rest of my life. Is this, 
it's feasible. Yeah, and I think the big – oh, 100%. And I think uh, a big factor in that was was John Hassett, our lifelong instructor. Is like he was – very like you know, there's, there's a lot of gyms where you go and you train and you go home. But he was always willing to talk to everybody, and he's a good storyteller, and he's really good uh, at articulating like his like how he's thinking and stuff. And he would always talk about how lucky he felt to be able to teach jiu-jitsu for a living and be around. You know, he'd always talk about all the guys that come in and be like, "Man, like doctor, lawyer, all this, and all they want to do is spend their money and their free time being here. I get to cut the middleman out. I'm here all day, you know." And uh, that kind of always stuck with me because he was genuinely a happy person when we went in the gym. He was great at his craft and he helped me a lot and, and so many other people. I was like, man, that ticks all the boxes kind of. You're doing what you love. You're making a living and you're helping people. So, I mean, it just seemed like a no-brainer because he was obsessed with jiu-jitsu and then I was obsessed with jiu-jitsu and martial arts and MMA as, as, at a young age. So, you know, I just kind of was like, I'm going to try to do that. Yeah, as a kid, and then as I got older and kind of the end of high school started approaching, I was competing a lot and actually winning by then. But uh, then the harsh reality of like, okay, like real life's going to come and, and I got to do something more than compete in these local tournaments that aren't, they don't pay anything, you know. And uh, that's when I was trying to like come to terms, like what do I want to do that will allow me to still compete at a high level, train a lot and all that. And then I'm going to college and uh, you know, with the intention of getting out and getting a job and then working one day toward maybe having a school or something and uh, just some life circumstances and crazy things happen. And I think, you know, for me, I have my faith. I believe in God and I believe, you know, his hands at work. But, you know, everybody calls it something different. But for me, I, I truly believe God's hand in my life. And uh, I did everything to avoid, you know, the path of like not going to school and, and becoming a fighter or not going to school and just teaching and training or whatever it was. And uh, lo and behold, I ended up in a jam where it was like broke, nothing, couldn't afford to pay like the remainder of the semester. I paid the first half out of my savings from a tournament I had won and then was like, oh, I, well, I got to work to pay the tuition. And then while I'm at work, I can't be at class. And I was working at a warehouse. And then uh, there was a fight like seven or eight weeks in town from there. And the way Myrtle Beach works, it's a very, very small town. So there's not like major sports. So you can get some good sponsorship and sell a lot of tickets and make it, you know, for a, for a local amateur fight, I could make, you know, two, three, four thousand dollars um, at that time at that event. I was like, I guess I got to do this. And then, you know, all of a sudden, next thing I know, I'm kind of living everything I kind of dreamed and pictured as a kid, you know, a couple years later. So did you drop out of college or you finished? I did uh, my senior year. Yes. You dropped out your senior year. What did you go to school? Hmm. Uh, so I had started, I think, in education. I was thinking like you'd have your afternoons off and your uh your summer's off, you know, I'd like more training. I could, you know, and then, uh, I ended up switching to, uh, exercise and sports science. Cause I was like, okay, I could be like a personal trainer or a strength and conditioning coach. And, you know, they go hand in hand. Isn't that funny that how, no matter how much you prepare to do the, the, the right, the thing as right as you possibly can. It's, and you know, you said you're, you're a religious person who thinks that, you know, it, it's kind of, you know, God kind of has his plan. Right. Um, so no, no matter how much you were still being smart with how you were planning to achieve all the things you wanted to do, um, it still found the way to twist itself into <laughs> into what you. One hundred percent, and and I honestly I would have been miserable, <laughs> and uh, I don't think that's a good way for me to to help people or to you know, uh, I'd probably be a miserable person to be around if I was doing that. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just. I'm anybody that knows me knows that would not really work out. Well, it's just, it wouldn't, I'd be wasted sitting behind a desk. I'm like, I gotta be doing something all the time. I, I love training all day. I love teaching. I love kind of burning the candle at both ends a little bit and teaching training, you know, running, picking up my daughter and then getting back in the gym. Like, uh, I don't think sitting still all day would have been a great thing for me. Yeah. No, I feel you on that. Um, so then, all right, so you're down there. So then how did you, so you started doing amateur fights seeing a little bit of profit there enough for it to like carry you through the, through the next one and, and kind of that whole deal. At what point there are you taking it? Like, are you feeling like you're taking it to the next level or are you now like really channeling all your energy towards becoming a pro fighter? Yeah. I mean, right from, from, from the jump, you know, so the second I signed uh, for the first amateur fight, it was like, okay, I'm going to do this, but I'm doing this to go to the UFC, you know, and if the indication is there that I can't, then I will, 
you know, hopefully be mature enough to know that and stop because I don't want to just be another guy who's in a gym talking about how, how tough I am. And, uh, you know, when you get to smaller towns, a lot of times you run into these guys that are like, Oh, if only I had this opportunity, I would have made it. But really what you don't know is behind the scenes, they're like turning down opportunities that could get them there. So I just never wanted to be that. Um, the first fight was profitable because it was in town. And then after that, it was like fights in our town shut down. Like, so the first fight, I'm like, oh, I made a little bit of money. I'll be all right. And you're like, oh, well, there's no more fights coming to town. Um, so I ended up having to travel. My plan was, you know, in South Carolina, where we were, you needed five amateur fights and an 80% winning rate to go pro at that time. Um, so I was like, I'm just going to knock out five fights as, as fast as I can within a year. And I wrote down somewhere in a book that I was going to be pro within a year. And I missed it by like seven days or six days just because of the way the events lined up. So I uh, knocked out my five amateur fights. I think I had like seven or eight minutes in the cage total with five fights, five submissions, and then went pro that following October up in Atlantic City at CFFC. So I fought uh, Atlantic City, Philly, Atlantic City, Philly. And then uh, so my first four pro fights were all in the Northeast because I knew it was, you know, if I want to get to the UFC, Bellator, PFL, any of those, then I'd have to be fighting at a place that, you know, was a high level of competition and that had eyes on it. And CFFC is that ring of combat. I fought one fight there as well. And uh, I didn't really want to hide in the, you can go to Kentucky, no offense to Kentucky and go fight a guy with uh, you know, a five and 15 record. But I just thought that was the long, long hard way where I may find out when I get to the contender series of the UFC that I, I've just been fighting bums and I don't have it. Whereas like CFFC ring of combat, all that, like you're going to fight stiffer competition, but at least you're going to know whether or not you can, you can get where you want to go, you know? So it was kind of always with that intention of let's find out how far I can take this. Yeah, it was a little, definitely a lot of that because when I lived in Jersey and was like competing, uh, I was like 16, 17 going to the adult division and I would win, you know, but it was kind of just using my brain. Like I'd find a way to, you know, I'd rely on like uh, in jiu-jitsu matches, it would be like I'd rely on my like locks, you know, because it's like, oh, this guy's big, I'm small, I can get on his foot. You're not going to win MMA fights that way or, or win at the highest level with just one technique, you know, and it was kind of stuff like that or knowing the rules, like knowing usually you can't do this technique, but in this in this event you can, I'm, and this guy didn't know that. And, um, but when I got to the South, I really put a lot of time in the gym. I really kind of researched developing fast twitch muscle and and how to do that. And, I started out like an idiot. I was just lifting as heavy as I possibly could every single day. I'd do like uh, a heavy lift in the afternoon then uh, at Fitness Edge MMA where I started out down here. I would go do their CrossFit class on top of that. I grappled twice. Like I was just like training like a maniac and uh, and eating like a maniac, you know, not uh, unhealthy, just like researching like, oh, I've always been eating like to try to lose weight. I should be eating to gain weight. Uh, I ended up gaining about 20 pounds my first year down there. And I was like, oh, like this is what it feels like to grapple with some strength, you know? And uh, I got really into strength and conditioning during that period. And, you know, I, I don't think I'm the worst athlete on the roster anymore. That's for sure. I don't have two left feet. I, I have decent footwork. I can be explosive. And uh, I was never like that growing up. Well, I think a lot, you know, it depends on who you talk to, but a lot of it, you know, you talk about heavy deadlifts, heavy squats, the basic stuff that, I just wasn't doing like I had done. I was big on conditioning when I lived in Jersey and was kind of competing jujitsu locally. I do hill sprints. I do, you know, some long runs. I was like big on circuit training, but I was a, a small frame kid. I needed to put on muscle and I just had never really been introduced to that. Uh, and so I really moved down there and that was a, a big benefit to me. It was like a lot of, you know, for the, when I started, I would just do five sets of five on every exercise as heavy as I could. Which probably now, like if I did that now, I wouldn't be able to do my skill work properly. But back then I was 18, 19, you don't get tired, you know. So uh and then over you know, through that I ended up getting with some good strength and conditioning coaches, um, doing some trade out for like sponsorship, like sessions and in return for, you know, social media posts or t shirt logo or um so I worked with a guy, Tad Rubin was the first one I ever worked with and he I was just competing in jiu jitsu and he was willing to trade out and, you know, give me an opportunity just because he he liked how into training I was and uh we did some really fun training. And then from there, I started working with a guy, Keith Hare, later on, who was a great, great help to me. And then, uh, you know, now at the, you know, uh, the owner of the gym, Mike Kelly, is like a genius with that stuff. So I always consult him. And uh, yeah, we just got some good minds around. It, so I always try to ask everybody. I'm kind of a, kind of really annoying with it, but I always want to know, you know. You're a student on the sport, right? Um, 
So tell me about when you finally go pro. What what is what is and then so you were you were in the contender series? Is that how you got I was, yeah, I was in the Daylight Contender Series. Okay. So take like what jump let's jump to like right before that. So what happens in you do the last pro fight you do before you go into that? Yeah, so I had uh I had been five and two, uh okay record at one fifty five. I mean, you know how it is. It's like there's some guys that are 10 and 0 that aren't signed. So I kind of thought I was, I was, you know, a year, two years, three years, even away from being called up for that opportunity type. But, uh, I was just trying to fight, fight as frequently as possible, training all year. Uh, got a short notice fight at CFFC where I kind of knew I would be fighting, but didn't know who or didn't have a contract till about two weeks out and fought a super tough guy, Jacob bond or bone. And, uh, one of the toughest fights I've ever had his record was deceiving. I think he was like seven and five at the time. Um, but he was one of the toughest guys I've ever fought. And, uh, you know, in the past I had been such kind of like a, a fast starter and been submitting everybody that the, the first loss I had had was like, you know, I had, I made it out of the first round. I didn't know what to do. It wasn't a shape thing. I had an adrenaline belt and got beat up. And, uh, so it kind of, and then the second loss I had, I had had two good rounds and lost in third. So I had never been able to be like that guy to grind out a decision. And, uh, he kind of bought that out in me. I ended up grinding to a decision. And I think if that didn't happen, I wouldn't be re- I wouldn't have been ready to go in the contender series. I wouldn't have that confidence of going, oh, I can fight three hard rounds. Like he bought out a very like grueling fight. He was uh, very squirmy, very hard to hold on to. We transitioned a lot. And uh, yeah, it was awesome. And it was the first fight I ever hurt anybody on the feet and watched them kind of stumble and get rocked. And that was cool for me because my boxing coach put so much time into me and uh, every fight I had grappled. So that was cool. And uh, after that, it was like a couple days later, a couple weeks later, maybe my manager at the time, had uh, messaged me like one of the uh, early in the morning one time. I was like, yo, can you get footage of uh, your fight before that? I had a quick triangle at a uh, ring of combat. And it was kind of flashy. And he's like, yeah, uh, I-, I need it. And I was like, okay, I can't really figure out how to send it. It's not working. He's like, well, can you get on it? And he sent me a screenshot from Sean Shelby asking about like, what about that Selecki guy? And I was like, oh, I can figure it out. And uh, a couple of days later, he said we had the opportunity. And like a couple of days after that, I was in Vegas filming pre-production stuff about 13 or 14 weeks out from the actual fight. And I was like, this is crazy. Like, I can't believe that, you know, three months I'll be back and I'll be fighting for, for a life changing opportunity really. So how did, how did that moment when you saw that screenshot, like, how did that really feel? I mean, something you've been working for, for a long time, you know, did you think of that, of that, uh, that did it all come together at some point? It did after I actually got the contract. I said it when I was doing like, it was a small little media row they had for us, you know, but, I said, I'm like, yeah, like I, I'm usually watching this on Saturdays after the fight, staying up, like watching late, you know, the presser. Uh, and I, I, the next thing out of my mouth was like, I started training this long ago and I used to love watching Chuck and Tito Ortiz and now I'm fighting where they were fighting. That's kind of crazy, you know, and that's when it really set in. But until then it was just panic. Cause I think for me, I, I was uh, seven and two at the time and I'm like, I'm not going to get another shot. So it was a really stressful time leading up to that fight it was just, I'm either going to going to win and, and, uh, you know, continue on this journey and hopefully get a contract or I'm going to lose and be to the back of the line. Then I got some decisions to make about, do we want to continue knowing that you kind of already blew your shot? So, uh, that was probably the most pressure I ever felt in my entire career. What did you do to power through that pressure? Uh, trained, I <laughs> just trained, man. It was, I was one of those things where I was trying, I was trying everything to, you know, calm down about it and feel better about it. And it was one of those things where it was like the only way out was just through. I'd be driving. Like it was one of the only times where, you know, I, I go for runs and stuff. I like to think about the fight and like, I'll be, I have long drives to the gym. Sometimes I could train in other towns and uh, I like to think about the fight, listen to music. And I could not think about the fight that camp. Like it would just make me sick. And we were hurting financially too. My car broke down, the transmission blew. It was like anything that could have went wrong, went wrong. When they announced the fight on TV, and put our name like, oh, it's you know, three weeks from now, main event. This day, it's just like people were texting it to me. I was broken down the side of the road waiting for my mother in law to come pick me up and sitting in the car with her going, I promise if I don't win, I'll make a nice life for your daughter. Like it was, uh, it was a rough lead up, but it was all worth it. So, you so they're announcing your fight in the UFC and you're broken down on the side of the road with not, not much money to your name. No, I bar- I borrowed. The, I mean, I borrowed, it was all the same money, but I had to use my wife's paychecks to, to pay for the used transmission. Uh, yeah, it was just, uh, it was like, people were like, oh man, you, you're made it. Look, your name's on TV. You're going to be fighting in three weeks. And I was like, you have no idea my situation right now. <laughs> like, people, don't, 
don't see that, that, that often. And um, it's what makes you guys. to succeed you know you, you spend whole, your whole fucking life uh really just chasing that that goal uh, and i read something about you which which to simply put it you love to do it and you just want to do it for One hundred percent. Yeah, it's a, it's a passion for me, and then when it comes to the family sense, it's a career, you know. Um, and I think I've been, you know, uh, really super fortunate to be able to do this, you know. And selfishly, I want to keep doing it. I'll do whatever it takes to feed my family. But uh, yeah, that's that's the that's the privilege for me. I get to go to work every single day and do something. I, I really enjoy the grind part of it. I mean, I know people. Everybody says that, but people don't actually. I like getting on an air nine and feeling like I'm gonna die. Like it's a nice feeling to come through on the other side and be like, man, I'm so much tougher than I used to be or whatever it is. Like I, I, I like it. And then the other side of that is I get to go to work and hang out with my friends every day. Like <laughs> I train my buddies, you know, John Salter, White Hopkins, Corey Crumpler, Nick Maz, the same guys in the gym every day. Then we go to Charlotte, we train. It's like a big family reunion because we go up there only in camp with our head coach, Jeff Jimmo, all the guys are up there, Brian Barbarian, he fights in the FC, Holtz. Like it's like a big, it's like a big brotherhood, you know? And it's like, it's it's awesome you know so it's it's fun for me and then i get to with every win and with every you know every year training every you know you get you get to start teaching you get to start coaching and you get to kind of pay it forward and that's rewarding too you know it's it's great for that person and i want you want to give but it's also rewarding for me it's a good feeling for me to help somebody out watch them you know be better than i was at that point in time or you know i'm working with a guy now juan lopez and like he's like got striking down he's got two amateur fights i'm like you know i couldn't throw i didn't throw a punch in a fight until like my third pro fight, you know, like, uh, so it's, yeah, it's selfishly, I, I want to be able to continue to do that for, for a long time, but, uh, sacrificially, I don't want any of the other nonsense. I, I really don't. I'm an introvert. So, uh, you know, if it comes, it's great. It's more opportunity, but I want to be the best to know I'm the best. I don't want to be the best to be on a magazine cover. It's not really, you know, doesn't do anything for me. Then definitely. Thank you for doing this, uh, since you're an introvert, <laughs> but I like, well, I like, I like talking to people like you, you know, like, we're going to talk about meaningful stuff i think that's cool if we're going to talk about the weather i'd probably be like oh, i'll do it some other time but but this is i like talking about life you know <laughs> yeah um so i has to be supportive of the sport she's been with you through thick and thin um you got a baby daughter right just one girl mm -hmm. yeah yeah one year old that that family bond seems super tight is that like is that all you care about at this point? Are they super supportive? The family's still together. Your fam, you know, your parents and, and siblings. Everybody's uh, on the on the bandwagon here. Yeah, we got a super tight knit, type, super tight knit in my house. You know, and me and my wife and our daughter, and uh, and we got and we got you know we got a great you know when you when you do this for a living, it's like you spend so much time. It reminds me of it reminds me of the mafia when you watch like Goodfellas. Like, you know, you ever see when they talk about like uh, you know the wedding anniversary they come over and you're like, man, we never hung out with anybody else. Like, it's like everybody's uncle, this and this, and, that. and that's kind of how your gym becomes because you, this is our whole life, you know? So, uh, we're nice to have a, a nice gym family too. It's all the dog jujitsu with the Salters and uh, a bunch of other people there that we, you know, we all have kids the same age too. So it's kind of cool. Our kids will kind of grow up together and, uh, yeah, we got a tight knit community, but my, my wife's the best, you know, she saw it the whole way through. And then, you know, I had, I had some confidence coming out of the gate for sure. Going, I went eight and no, you know, five and I was an amateur, three and I was a pro. I'm like, all right, this is going to be good. But then I got beat up in Philly and my confidence kind of, you know, went down real quick and then came back one, two, lost again. And the whole time she's just up. She's just, you know, I'm like, I don't think I need to quit. She's like, you don't need to quit. I don't want you to quit. And uh, I don't know if she just has very low expectations or, or tons of belief in me, but it always seems like tons of belief, you know, even when I get a fight, it's just funny. Like, she follows the sport. She knows how tough all these guys are and all that. And like, she's never, never stressed, you know, never worried. Um, and she's been the best through it all, you know. And when I told her about this dream, I told her on a second date what I wanted to do, you know. And, I, and it wasn't even with MMA. It was just, I was competing jiu jitsu at the time. And then about the week later is when I ended up having to take the fight, the first fight. But uh, I was like, look, like, I don't have a ton of time. I, I don't, 
I'm not going to have money. I, we can't go out. Like, you know, I'll do, but anytime I can, I will. But uh, this is what I want to do. And if it plays out, it's going to work out for us because I want to do this for like, I'm like a crazy person on the second date. She should be like a uh, clinger back off. But uh, I'm like, look, like I want to do this for me. I want to do this for us. Like it'll pay off and have a nice life. But you know, if, if not, I will stop and, and, and do the right thing. You know? And she's like, I'm in. Like, and I, first of all, she should never agree to that with a crazy person. I should never been talking about that on the second date crazy person but uh that's kind of how we always did it. it was just super transparent you should be questioning your wife's sanity because that's a lot <laughs> and even i got to shout out her family because they could have been like at any point in time i was always working you know when we lived in Myrtle beach i worked a job at a, at a place called the Myrtle Beach spine center they were two of the most supportive people in my life and my boss is there but uh you know her family never being like yo dude what are you doing like you just got knocked out time to get a real job like what are we doing I have been text. I guess there's been times I've been texting with, with my father-in-law being like, Hey, like, you know, I promise I'm going to make this work and, and make it my job. And if, if not, I'll do it. You know? And he's like, no, we love it. We believe in you. My mother-in-law, we started out living in my mother-in-law's guest room, her, myself. And, uh, and then we got a dog we weren't supposed to, uh, and then she still kept us. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of always been a group effort for me. I've always had great people around me. Um, listen, you should ignore them. Uh, instead of worrying about that and doubting yourself. So, uh, kudos to them. That's awesome. Yeah, and having the, the real people around because we live in with the Instagram era, it's the time where delusion is just so easy, you know, to start believing you're the best thing since sliced bread. And they were people that would be honest with you, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So they supported you. And as soon as you become very famous, they're going to shut you down real quick. <laughs> no, you know, I'm, I'm shooting for, I was hoping for March. I was hoping for April at the latest. Um, you know, I've talked to my manager here and there, and he's saying hopefully that time frame. But uh, I got nothing set in stone, so I'm coming off my first loss in the UFC. And to be to be frank, it sucks. You know, uh, it was a split decision. It was a tough fight. It was a grind. Uh, I made some bad decisions. He made some. I guess he made some bad ones too because I, I won some rounds. But uh, you know, he, he he pushed the pace, and I ended up losing a split decision. So I've been back. And, and it's been a fun, it's been a fun process though. It sucks because it leaves bad taste in your mouth, but it's gotten me back to, I had to go, you got to reinvent yourself after these losses. You know, I don't think you can just make a tweak here and there, or just be like, Oh, it just, I'll write it off as an off day, you know, which it did in some ways feel like that, but uh, it's a nice opportunity to kind of reinvent yourself and get back to what makes you, you and make some improvements on that. So that, for me, it's been competing even, you know, uh, I did the Fight Pass Invitational in Vegas. It was a grappling tournament out at the Apex. Uh, did the Fury Grappling, did the Abu Dhabi Trials, which is some stuff I wouldn't have done before. I'd have been like a little arrogant about it. I'd have been like, ah, no, I fight for a living now. I'm not doing that. Like, uh, and getting these opportunities and having a blast and realizing like, yo, I got into this to be a martial artist, to have fun, to test myself, and everything else take care of itself. Just, just train and, and get better. And uh, I'm seeing it in my training. You know, So just training right now. Working with the guys, uh, helping everybody that's got stuff coming up, and then just saying yes to anything that comes up, man. Nobody in, in your field wants to lose. Uh, but once it does move, you know, once you do get past that, uh, is it a little exciting? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Uh, so for, for me, we, uh, you know, I have a boxing coach in Myrtle Beach, and uh, but I live in Wilmington. It's an hour and a half away, you know. so. I would go back and forth three times a week, but I wasn't getting a lot of reps in, in that area and stuff. So uh, I ended up joining a gym here in town where John Salter goes to a uh, boxing gym. And it's so funny. Cause it looks like I sent it to our head coach in Charlotte, a picture of the gym. I go, could this look any more like a movie set for a stereotypical boxing gym? And he's like, yo, they all look like that. It's so funny. But uh, walking in there, like you feel like you're in Rocky three, like I'm reinventing myself, you know? I was going to say, let, let me guess. It smells a little like shit. There's, yeah, just a little bit. 
Yep. The same hardwood floor that's in every boxing gym in every city in America. And, uh, but like you get that, like the like chills in your, in your, in your veins, you're like, man, like, I feel like I'm like writing my sequel right now. Like, this is awesome. You know, where it stinks to have lost. And especially when it comes down to like money and stuff, you're, you know, we're paid for show and win. You don't win. It stinks. But getting that chance to be like, yo, like think about everybody was like, oh, I can't believe you lost. You get these messages and all this stuff, which doesn't really matter, but it stings. And you're like, man, how good is it going to feel when I can get back in there and get my hand raised? Like, it's going to be worth all of it. So it is a fun opportunity. You know, you got to make the best out of it. And, and I'm super pumped to get back in there and, and show what I can actually do. If we're texting you, I can't believe you lost. Oh, it's Instagram. I should have never opened them. I should have never opened them. Terrible mistake. No, it was terrible. I started reading a few and we were laughing at them. And then I kept reading and I was like, oh, this went dark quick. I should not have done this. <laughs> Shut, shut all, you know, you got to shut all that stuff off. You can't pay attention to it. Um, so do you have a, do you have a couple minutes? We'll talk some fights for this weekend. You know, yeah, absolutely. You're a, you're a big watcher of the sport and your wife. Oh yeah, absolutely. And now, gosh, now baby, I didn't want her watching fighting. She's one year old. She's caught it. And now it's, everything's bop, bop. That's what, and she throws her little hands. She goes, bop, bop. My wife got fight pass on when I come home from the gym. She's like, I'm sorry. She was, she was calling for bop, bop. I'm like, don't show her this. What are we doing? So, yes, the three of us watch every car. That's, that sounds like my family in the house. Uh, the little, you know, the kids are just, they're, they're, they're basically fighting themselves out before the fight. <laughs> and then they're like, all right, we're done now. And my wife works. <laughs> um, so let's talk. We're going to see, you know, with this new technology, Gabby's going to try to, uh, you can't see this. I can barely see it because I don't have my glasses on. But, um. Gabby's going to read us some of the fights uh, on this weekend's UFC card, and I would love to hear your takes on it. Maybe we can make some picks. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely, man. Sounds great. All right, cool. Let me start from the bottom up. You can take your picks. All right. Apologize in advance for my pronunciations. Oh, that's good. Better you than me. <laughs> okay. So we have middleweight, Rodolfo Vieira, Wellington Terman. Uh, by the way, feel free to say, I don't know these people. Move on. <laughs> That's okay. I do it all the time. No, from, I know Rodolfo Vieira. He's one of the greatest jiu-jitsu guys, you know, in, in recent times. And he, I think he's coming off his first loss. And what's funny is when it happened, he tried to submit this guy a million times in the first round and had the adrenaline dump. Where you know he's in shape. You know he's great, a great fighter. But you could see he had just never been there. And I'm going, I, I know that exact feeling. I've had that happen. And uh, but so I, th I think I think he can beat most of the guys outside the top fifteen. So I'm picking him. Wasn't that fight pretty recent too? Yeah, I forget who he fought. The guy was scrappy, man. And he ended up submitting him. But um, but uh, I think feel like that was recent. Uh, it's alright. You don't have to look it up. Um, so I I I feel like after that experience, he gets the win in this one. Do you agree with that? I do. Yeah, I think so. All right, cool. All right, we'll move on. What else do we got, Gabby? Give me some big names. All right, bantamweight, Cody Stamen versus Said. They're Marga Medov. Is it Nermar Medov? Is he a Khabib cousin? I mean, unless they're common. I don't mean that in a negative way. I'm just yeah. curious. No, I think so. I think they're all. I think he's got like tons of family members. Mm -hmm. Uh, I like Cody typically. Do you have anybody on on this? Uh... Yeah, I, th I think the same. I think Cody's super well rounded, and uh, yeah, I've actually gotten to be near, like, be around him at the PI, and for that weight class, he's gigantic. Yeah, I think uh, that alone and his wrestling is makes him a problem. That doesn't sway me. Uh, per Ida is the, the, the crazy fella, correct? The very uh, energetic. <laughs> Yeah. Didn't he just did he win didn't he go against um 
uh, Johnny Walker, right? Uh, no, I think they're they're buddies. Yeah, because Walker's a two hundred five. Yep, 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 yep. Because mm-hmm. I was actually on one of the cards with one of them there to get her. I can't remember who it was. I th- he's definitely coming off a win, I think. Well, he either way, while she looks it up, uh, he's always an exciting. Okay. Ah, yep. Yeah, he's he's good. Uh, I'm gonna go Parita. Me too. We gotta start disagreeing. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> those are like I think those are mismatched fights. Other than the then we met on one. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to pick against Moreno because he looked great in both. You know, he struggled in the first one a little bit, and there was that, uh, what, somebody lost a point. But, I mean, the last one was a complete shutout. I know figueredo has got power, but Moreno does too, and he's got a chin, so I'm, I'm picking Moreno. Also, we got the same management. He's kind of like the, the front runner for Iridium right now because he's the champion on the roster. So I got to back him and support him. So, yeah, definitely going Moreno. All right, so do me a favor. I promise I'm I'm gonna not complain for whoever has heard the, the few people who have heard this and have heard me complain. I'm, I'm gonna talk about this. Not a ton, you know. I don't. I, I it's not what I'm craving, you know. What it is. Yeah, you would think. Yeah, you would think they want Moreno's champ because he's the first champ from Mexico, you know? And they've been pumping him out a lot. They've been playing on the fact he's kind of kind of dorky with the Legos until he's a fun guy, you know? Uh I don't understand why they would wouldn't just go to the next contender in line, you know. It doesn't make any sense. I agree. I mean, I would have done a, a sweet collab deal with Lego and done a whole thing with <laughs> And then adults would be buying the Legos to display. I mean, just saying. <laughs> he's talented as all hell. He's gritty. He's got a good story. I just don't know why they keep on putting him in this place. I, he had to agree to it. So obviously he's making, I'm sure, good money for it. And that's mm-hmm. uh, it's just, I have no excitement towards it. I don't see it going any different. I hear that Cejudo's in, uh, what's his name's corner. Uh, I don't think it makes a difference. Cejudo needs to stop talking on Instagram already. I'm sorry, dude. I'm just so cringy. He's so cringy. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I can unfollow him, but I choose not yeah. to for whatever reason. <laughs> I am I am way too old to be commenting negatively on anybody, so I would never do that. I'm so tempted to be like, are you lonely? Like, why? <laughs> you know? That's, it's, mm-hmm. Even Dana White's like, I thought he was retired. Why is he still picking fun? Um, I am going to go Moreno all the way on this one. I would hate if he lost. I'll say that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and like, Figueroa is kind of not like a super likable fighter. You know, like, he's kind of like a little bit like the bad guy a little bit. I don't know. I have a hard time with the bad guy. Uh, listen, I, yeah, I've, I've never been a fan. His walkouts cringe as well. <laughs> Maybe maybe four fights. <laughs> then you know what? You might as well just close out the whole division and just let, let them two fight. <laughs> uh, it's terrible. Uh, okay. So, <laughs> sorry. I'm very happy that they didn't make it the main event, at least. All right. Carry on. Main event. Main event. Ganu Gane. All right. Let's do the best we can at breaking this down in the most detail possible, since they are so fucking big, and the chances of knockouts are very high. <sighs> yeah. For a second, who do you have and why, and how do you see it going? 
if knockouts weren't a thing, I think it's zero God, 10 times out of 10. You know, I think he moves like a little guy. He's got great head movement. He's got unorthodox attacks. And I think everybody, you know, is so sold on Francis's power because it's a legit thing. But anybody at that weight class has one punch power, you know? So uh, aside from a, well, I don't, it's MMA. So obviously they're going to get hit by each other. But I think gone. But again, Francis, he's going to touch him at some point in five rounds. But uh, we've seen Francis come out and be timid with the first Derek, or yeah, the Derek Lewis fight. And uh, I think because they're training partners, he may again. He's been a little bit of a head case in the past, had to overcome that. So if he comes out like that, I think Don will kind of eat him up a little bit. So you think uh, Ngannou loses by decision? I would never put money on a heavyweight fight, but if I had to pick gun to my head, I'd probably go that way, yeah. So I'm sure you do the same thing, but like I have so many like where I, I'm so confident in something that pops into my head, and then like I get the opposite, and it then completely negates it. But like at first I was like, is Ngannou just catches? They all oh, he he always catches you. He'll find a way, have a moment, and he will, and it'll be done. But then at the same time, I'm like, what if he's the one that gets knocked out? Mm-hmm. You can, and you have to be able to see that because, like you said, it's the heavyweight division. We're talking very high skilled level fighters, uh, one more so than the other, maybe. Uh, do you think Ngannou can get caught and dropped? Yeah, I think I think you gotta, the thing about him is he's come out and had stellar performances and he's come out and had terrible performances. He's never really – like you look at somebody like John Jones who has stellar performances and then the ones where he's off, it's like there's still him controlling somebody, you know. Maybe that person has, has a round that's good or uh, it's a closer fight, but he's never like in danger. But we've seen him lay some eggs, you know, and then have great – I think the great performances outweigh the, the bad ones. But he seems like he's been up and down, you know, with, with the Steve A fight, the first one, kind of overlooking him. Like, why would you do that? That guy's heavyweight champion of the world. He said, I overlooked him. I thought I was going to finish running around. Um, with the Derek Lewis fight where nothing really happened. So, I mean, he's shown that he he's definitely human, you know, whereas uh, Gon's kind of been steady the whole time, I think. So I, I think that makes it interesting. I think, I think that definitely means he could come out and be gun shy of the former training partner or be – or he's shown he's been emotionally immature. Maybe he's going to come out and try to take his head off because he's, you know, the, the bad blood and all that. And I think that wouldn't play into his favor either. Yeah. I don't know. I, all I do know is that if you put those two guys on a podcast together, it will be a terrible episode. I hope it's an exciting fight. I hope it's a good fight. Um, yeah. What's his name? Who did I just talk about earlier before the show? From the post? Oh, Tim Kennedy. Tim Kennedy. Um, that uh, John Jones beats. I don't know. He's gotten hit. He gets hit. And and against Francis, you can't get hit, you know, and, and gone too to an extent. So I don't know. It just depends. And, you know, what's crazy is they say that, you know, his best thing is he's reckless and he's wild. And now we're talking about how disciplined he's being. Maybe he comes out kind of flat, you know? So I, I don't know. I think on his best night, he definitely can beat those guys. But I think saying 10 out of 10 times anytime with a heavyweight fight is just crazy because they all have that, that off button, that eraser. Very tip top of the division. I don't see it because John Jones, to me, wasn't looking great towards the end of his, his light heavyweight.
and will be harder to take down. I mean, even if they're not as good wrestlers, they're going to have heavier hips. You don't want to get caught underneath them, so you're going to be a little more te uh, tentative on your shots. And, and I think people don't even talk about Stipe. I think that's an intriguing fight. I think he's he's long, he's fast, and look what he did in the wrestling. He not only stuffed DC's takedowns, he took him down a couple times. So uh, I think that there's some good fights there that it's not. I don't think it's a shoe in at all. I think he could be fun in the mix, but I don't think he's going to be Mister Dominant up there. You know. I agree. I think I think putting him against Stipe is the money fight for Stipe. It's a great fight for 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 John Jones, who who can win, and then really sell people. Even if it's bullshit, he can really sell people on the fact that he could become the champ. Uh, but if you throw him immediately against the big guys, I feel like that's a that's a kind of a dumb business move um, for everybody. Uh, and Stipe would give that that would be a hell of a fight. I think that would be an enjoyable fight, and either either of them can get it. Mm -hmm. I just thought I'd uh, get your thoughts on that, uh, brother. Thank you so much for being in the show. Thanks for taking you know time out of your uh, family and and you know your your personal life to to do this with us. Uh, and thanks for picking some fights. Um, for you know we'll wrap it up together. But for all those of you who have not purchased our new shirts, I'm gonna make you be a part of the show while I'm selling shirts. Um, <laughs> it's a beautiful shirt. And if you're from the Philly area, you know Philly is harder uh, and different. So get your shirts. Uh, on the website, cagesideshow.com. Uh, brother, it's been a pleasure. Much success uh, to you and the fam, and we look forward to seeing you. Man, thanks so much for having me on, man. I really enjoyed our time. Thanks for having me. And that shirt is awesome. <laughs> you hear that, everybody? You hear that? It's a good shirt. <laughs> Wrap it up, Gabby. <laughs>